And he gave me 12 weeks. And not only did he give me 12 weeks, but he brought his wife along, and he also pulled another local pastor who committed to 12 weeks of ministry to this church and really helped us through a very difficult time. And uh, he was dear friends with us before. Um, I've seen Skip do things I can't repeat. It's uh, always funny when he comes to our house. Uh, you just never know what a guy can do with a mason jar. I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. It is, is a really exciting time. And I have told the, the, the story time and time again where my wife picked up poop while you were at the door so that you wouldn't see the kids poop in the floor. Yes, Skip was the poop missionary. That's, that's the one, folks. Uh, just <laughs> and uh, it was, it was a very, it's been a very exciting journey with Skip. Uh, not only did Skip help us in Lakeside, but what a lot of people don't know is when I was very young and very just a new Christian and just barely saved and really had no business in ministry except just God had called me. And I had no formal training. I had no idea what I was doing. And you know when you're young and you know everything, you don't want help. And see, Skip tricked me because his wife could play the guitar. So he tricked me into thinking I was getting a worship leader. And really what he was doing is he took me under his wing and trained me without me knowing it. Because he, he probably knew some city slicker young person, you know, punk that knew everything, wouldn't receive very well. So he just kind of backdoored me. And uh, it was also under the guise, well, we need to disciple these students. But I want you to sit into the class so you can see how I disciple these students. And, and little did I know that I was receiving how to obey God how to obey man. I'll never forget those classes. And uh, these little books that just changed my life and radically transformed me and discipled me. And, and the large part of the person I am today is, is because Skip made an investment in a young guy that really didn't know he needed help and provided a friend. And we, we did some pretty crazy things in Louisville. And uh, we saw some pretty awesome things happen. And we did some real ministry there. We, we, there were some kids that were struggling. And, and Skip and I have done jail ministry together. Yes, we've, we've heard the clank together. And I tell you what, that clank is scary regardless. When you hear that door clank and you think, boy, I'm at their mercy. If they don't let me out, I'm not getting out of here. It's pretty exciting. But anyways, I just feel that Skip is not just a missionary to this church, but he's a personal friend. And, and I'm just so excited to have him here this morning. So if you all would give him a great big welcome. Thank you. Wow, what an introduction. Praise God. I am a missionary, and uh, I have some weird beliefs, okay? So I just want you to get ready because it's not fair that missionaries go forth by themselves. And I really believe that as we leave these doors this morning, we all enter into a vast mission field. Amen. Now, I've spent 33 years with Teen Challenge, came to Louisville 17 years ago to start a new Teen Challenge program, and we realized that what David Wilkerson said 30 years ago came to pass in Kentucky. And what David Wilkerson said 30 years ago was that if we didn't have a major paradigm shift in America, we would see every problem of the inner city and ghetto in every crook and cranny of rural America. Every addiction that we see in the inner city, now we see in every crook and cranny of rural Kentucky. While I was Teen Challenge Director, we started a program called Lifeline Connection. And you'll, you're going to see a little video on it. And what we were able to do with Lifeline was to go into smaller communities and see churches come together. And trust me, in Kentucky, the drug addiction problem, the drug crisis, was the one reason that pastors would come together and pray. Because pastors didn't know what to do. And these pastors begin to come together and pray and say, what can we do about this addiction crisis in our community? And pastors came together to pray. And then they begin to march to take back what the enemy had stolen. And I don't know about you, but I am tired of the enemy stealing the next generation. And so we started this program, Lifeline Connection. And during this time, I was asked to be on the National Board of Teen Challenge. And every time I'd go... To the national board meeting, Mike Hodges, our president of Teen Challenge USA, would say, Skip, tell us about this lifeline you're doing in Kentucky. And so every board meeting, I'd tell a little bit about lifeline and a little bit more the next board meeting. Pretty soon he said, you know, if this thing can work in Kentucky, can't it work across this country? And I was asked three years ago to be the national director of lifeline, so we want to show you the DVD on lifeline connection.
I've uh, been using drugs ever since I was about 12 and uh, been in and out of doing out detention, rehab. I've been to prison five times for drugs. I don't even like to think of myself the way I used to be. I don't. You could have held my family a bag of dope over the bridge and I'd say, give me the dope, I gotta go. Man, I have a wonderful family and I can't believe I almost flushed it down the toilet for nothing. The drug deprived me of my daughter. It just didn't destroy my son and his wife. It destroyed all of us. So eventually the drug took her, took her from me. Me and Steve got married and we were high. I barely even remember it. When I got out of prison, I had to meet Steve straight. I was straight, he was straight. We didn't know each other. Today's research indicates changing demographics resulting in less than 20% of addicted clients who are willing to commit to a long-term residential program. To meet today's needs, Teen Challenge presents Lifeline, a small group ministry offering immediate hope and help to those who need it most as a faith-based alternative to court-ordered groups such as Alcoholics Anonymous, Al-Anon, and Anger Control. What we're trying to do with uh, drug users and drug dealers is to say, listen, you're doing wrong and you need to stop. But we're here to help you and we want you to know we're your friend, not your enemy. Lifeline groups meet as a non-residential ministry teaching the Christian philosophy of recovery through discipleship. The five steps of recovery include decision, positive peer choice, accountability, boundaries, and consistency. When no one else cared whether I lived or died, when everybody had gave up on me, he was a God that came down and stood with me and said, I've got you. While Lifeline deals directly with people impacted by life controlling issues of all kinds, Lifeline also makes the most of the opportunity to offer ministry to family members affected by the client's addiction. With the way our life was before, while she was on drugs and the way it is now, uh, you know, it's, it's a joy to get up of a morning. You sleep longer at night. Reaching out to those already serving time in a county or state correctional facility is another way Lifeline reaches out to those in need. At first I thought no one would understand my past and I thought no one would think that I would have a future because of the things I've done. And since I've been in Lifeline ministry, it lets me know my past is exactly that, it's my past. Many inmates prefer and need the encouragement and accountability of Christian recovery yet choose not to go to a residential program because of time already served and the additional loss of time with family and work life. To be able to tell somebody that there is hope, you know, when you take somebody that's 22 year addict, street level dealer to support their own habit and say that there is hope, that's exactly what it means, there's hope. Each Lifeline ministry is unique. A trained and accountable leadership ministry team facilitates meetings with the groups on a needs basis progressing to provide groups every night of the week and Saturday mornings. Stepping into Freedom is a Christ-centered 12-step program and serves as one of the foundational ongoing groups in Lifeline. The Insight Group is the upward path to Christian character based on 2 Peter 1 verses 2 through 11. For family members, there is a Concerned Persons Group, a Christ-centered Al-Anon type of group that deals with enabling and codependency. The goal of Christian recovery in Lifeline is discipleship and to help the person move from the spiritual care of Lifeline to the spiritual care of a local congregation. Jesus is the proven cure. Lifeline is part of a multi-denominational team helping the people at the grassroots level take back their community by providing screening for residential programs, follow-up for graduates of residential programs, and offering immediate hope and help to those who simply need Jesus' love modeled by his people. You can help. You can be a part of Lifeline. What I love about being part of Lifeline is that we're seeing people involved in ministry that never before have been involved in ministry. And to see ordinary, everyday folks anointed with the Holy Spirit reaching out to people that are incarcerated that may be on home incarceration maybe they're uh, look to the groups for alternative sensing but we're taking the ministry of teen challenge outside the walls 
How many of us know the ministry don't belong in the side of the walls? We got to go out to the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. Hallelujah. It's been interesting with the lifeline. Uh, we're going into states such as Wyoming, and we set up a lifeline in Casper, Wyoming, and now Cheyenne, Wyoming. Those two ministries are coming together, and they're probably going to start a residential teen challenge program. That's exciting. In February, I'll be going to Salt Lake City and doing a training for Lifeline, and we hope there that we'll start a women's residential teen challenge. But at the same time, we'll keep the groups going. We'll keep the non-residential ministry going because less than 20% of addicts will go into residential care. And listen, Jesus is the answer. He is the proven cure. And we want to cover all the bases, and we want to offer hope to every addict, whether they go into a program or not. Like I tell the men at Louisville Metro Corrections, guys, I'm coming in here to give you a program so you'll get with the program and you'll have, you can stay out of a program. Because guess what? The jail's a program. And I tell them, let's, let's put together a program, this thing of five components of recovery, accountability, boundaries. All of us need these five components. Decision. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You cannot, you're powerless to change another person. Decision. Only that person can make a decision to be in recovery and to seek the Lord in his life. Boundaries. He set the boundaries of the earth. How many of us realize today that American culture, the boundaries have come down? How we need to see the boundaries come up. And men, we're the ones that provide the boundaries for our families and our homes. Accountability. For we must all give an account of our lives to God. These five components of recovery, I don't care what you struggle with. Anger, pornography, food addiction, and trust me, when you don't smoke, food tastes oh so good. All of these things, we need these, uh, the accountability and the boundaries to help us to be overcomers in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, let's take our Bibles, and we're going to go to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And another one of our lifelines, we just had a meeting here in Kentucky. And in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky, a young lady named Kim Black, a farmer's wife, used to be the church secretary at our assembly church there in Lawrenceburg. Now she's doing lifeline, ministering to about 300 people a week through the groups. Isn't that incredible? Going into juvenile detention, the county jail there, ministering to people outside the jail. Listen, going into the jail and ministering, and you can talk to Eddie, everybody wants to come to jail to minister. That's the easy part. When these inmates, the day they get out of jail, they've got to have support, encouragement, and Christian community. And that's the challenge. That's what we try to do with the Lifeline ministry. I don't know if you're aware of it, but here in America, we are the most incarcerated nation on the face of the earth. We incarcerate almost 2.4 million of our citizens. We're 7 to 8 to 10 times more than any other developing country. You know what every major city, their major building program is? A new correctional facility. We're the incarcerated nation. Why? Because we're the addicted nation. 23 million addicted Americans. Mike Hodges, our national president of Teen Challenge, sat down and he looked at the statistics and he said, there's no way we can reach these folks through the residential programs alone. We've got to add this non-residential component. We've got to have every church in America engage in this war against drug and addictions. And that's what the lifeline is about. It's about the Christian community getting involved and saying, hey, we can do something. When I came to Louisville 17 years ago and found out that 300 AA groups meet in that city every week, and most of them meet in churches. Now listen, I'm all for AA, and I'm all for church. But I wonder how those two fit together. Because the church is not about AA. The church is about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's bring up AA out of the basement. Bring these folks into the congregation. Lead them to Jesus. Yes, they need the, the 12 steps. I'm all for the 12 steps. They're all biblical. But not about a higher power. About the only higher power that can set us free. Hallelujah. Somehow, if we're going to make a difference in America, every Christian has got to understand that we're all missionaries. We're all missionaries. And I believe in replicating myself as much as possible by the grace of God and working my way out of a job. If there's something I can do for the kingdom and the glory of God, I want to train you. And if I can help the addicted, anyone can. 
If I can speak up here, God will give you the anointing. He's given us this treasure in jars of clay. And I want to encourage us today as we leave these doors this morning, this after, early afternoon, we are entering into a vast mission field. Missions is changing in America. Things are changing so rapidly in America, it makes my head spin. Romans 12, 2, let's look at together. Be not conformed to the pattern of this world. If you've got that figured out, you need to get with me because I don't have that figured out yet. I don't know how not to be conformed to the pattern of this world. I'm not sure how that works. Where I'm from in Northeast Ohio, we've got a bunch of folks that they literally have tried not to conform to the pattern of this world. And they don't, they don't have cars. And they don't use electricity unless they're working for you. And they literally have tried not to conform to the pattern of this world. Y'all know who I'm talking about? Come on, we've got them in Kentucky. They're fine folks. They're great people, very moral, hardworking. They have a time-honored values that we need return to our culture, don't they? But I can tell you firsthand that they struggle with the same addictions that the rest of us struggle with. So this thing of not conforming to the world, it has nothing to do with the outward. Now let's look at the message translation of that scripture. Don't get so caught up in your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Don't get so caught up in your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Now I want to read you something out of a book I'm studying on. In the critical tension between cultural withdrawal and cultural accommodation, we need new and better ways, a new mind to equip a generation to live in, but not of, the world. Y'all with me on this? See, the church has taken two extremes. Often, the only way we know how to deal with the culture is to withdraw from the culture, to pull away, and to create our own little subculture. But you see, some way, somehow, by the grace of God, we can learn to live victoriously in spite of what's going on in the culture. Now tell me what's going on in our culture in America today. All you've got to do is turn on television. And you can see what in the world is going on in our culture. How many of us realize that God has called the church to affect the culture, not for the culture to affect the church? God's called us to make a change in our culture. What's going on in our culture? There's a tension there between withdrawal from the culture and accommodation of the culture. It seems today as if the church is accommodating the culture. Brothers and sisters, God has called us to a higher calling. He's called us to a holiness. He's called us to a life set apart for his service. Let's not get so caught up in our culture that we fit into it without even thinking. You and I are Christ followers. There's something different about us. And may the world see that, not outwardly necessarily, but something deep inside that's different. We have a treasure in this jar of clay. Now let's take our Bibles and we're going to go to Acts 13, 36. I love what your pastor said, that when he's a papa, he's going to wear out his grandkid. Well, I'm going to tell him he's got a few years ago. I thought that too, but I got a grandkid, three years old, and he wears me out. And he's a new gener he's the brand new generation. Listen, this morning, I want to applaud this church because in this church, every generation is represented, and you know what? Almost equally so. I've not done a count, but it seems as if each generation is equally represented in this congregation. I think you need to applaud yourselves. I think that's awesome. Awesome. And listen, if you're like me and you're over the hill and you're a papa, listen, we need you more than ever. We need you more than ever. You have time-honored values. 
and traditions that this church needs. Don't ever, ever think that you're too old, that you don't fit in. We need you all that are papas and ninis, or what do you call yourselves? My wife calls herself nini. I call her nutty, okay? So she don't want to be called grandma. By the way, your pastor is coming in a couple weeks to Shively Worship Center. And I'm amazed at the missions that this church is supporting. But your pastor is taking time out to help the last church, Assembly God Church, inside the Waterson that my wife is endeavoring to pastor. And this church is praying for that church and praying, going to be praying more and helping us because we need help in the inner city. And guess what? The inner city is a vast mission field. If you've never been to Portland in Louisville, you know, often we want to go overseas and we want to go to places, but I will tell you, every nationality is represented in Louisville. You want to come to the mission field? Come on down. Come on down. You don't have to go overseas. You can come to Louisville, Kentucky. One of the young men that attended my group at Louisville Metro, he says, my dad, he told me, he said, my father passed away last week at 53 from a drug overdose. He says, I'm from Portland. My mother died two years ago from a drug overdose. Now I'm an addict and I'm locked up. What hope is there for me? And I want to tell you, I have to be honest with you. I looked at that young man. I thought to myself, what hope is there for this brother? He's lost both his parents to addictions. And I'm here in this jail, middle white, white kid, middle class white old man, coming in here like I know the answers. Brother, how do you know what I'm talking about? The stories are there. You don't know what to say. But I did my usual thing. Talked about all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. How we can be justified freely by His grace. But the young man came back next week. He came back the week after that. I haven't seen him for a little while. He may be somewhere else. But he came back with a smile. And I just have to trust in the grace of God that in spite of his deceased parents, and the addictions that have gone on for generations that the grace of God will reach him and change his life. We need help in the inner city. We need help in Louisville. And thank you, Pastor Tim, for coming in a couple of weeks to help Beth because she needs help too. How we need to pray for other congregations. How we need to see our churches in Kentucky united for the glory and the kingdom of God. You know, when we start talking about working with addicts, it's the hardest work in the world. And we meet, I meet these guys, these other programs, and they got their name and their program. They're successful, and this program's successful, but nobody wants to work together. And when I go to a place and they tell me they want to start a teen challenge, I tell them, you're crazy. What do you want to do that for? Isn't there anything else to do in life? It's the hardest work in the world. Every, not every story's a victory. There's a lot of defeats. I don't mean to be negative, but I'm saying, throwing out there realistically, working with addicted people is very hard. And it's a heartbreaking work. That's why we need one another. We need unity among the body of Christ. Churches need to come together for the glory and the kingdom of God. Because guess what? Christianity is not the fastest growing religion in America anymore. We've got a vast mission field. Now, Acts 13, 36, I love this scripture. David fulfilled God's purpose. And when David fulfilled God's purpose for his generation, he was laid to rest. How many of us know we're part of a generation? And I like my generation. I'm an aging baby boomer. There's se we used to be 78 million of us knuckleheads, but we're dying off pretty quick. When you see an old boy in a Harley Davidson, big old pot belly, long gray ponytail, that's an aging baby boomer, okay? He'll never admit he's over the hill. I've got a 40th high school reunion coming up in August. And I know they're going to ask me to pray over these 300 graduating class of Chardon High School, 1974. I don't know what I'm going to pray. But I'm praying about what I'm going to pray because I know they're going to need a lot of prayer. These aging baby boomers. And God has called me to reach my generation. To fulfill God's purpose 
for my generation as David did. So I want you to think about your generation. Are you fulfilling God's purpose for your generation? Think about the uniqueness of your generation. Us baby boomers, we're the first generation to grow up with television. God help us. Turn the television off. All right? You want to have peace in your home? You want to have the Holy Spirit in your home? Turn the television off. Now that's my soapbox for today. Forgive me for being a little legalistic. But the baby boomers were the first generation with television. We're the generation that wanted peace and the generation that wanted freedom. And we brought about a lot of cultural change to America, most of it not very good. So think about fulfilling God's purpose for your generation and what's going on in your generation. Now, I wish that the scripture would have left that alone. But there's another interesting scripture. It's Psalm 71, verse 18. And for those of us that are aging baby boomers, and I know you're squirming, and you don't have to raise your hand. I see you. I see you aging baby boomers, okay? There's a challenge, because the Bible says in Psalm 71, Lord, even when I'm older and grayer, don't forsake me until I declare your power to the next generation. How many of us know there's a next generation and a next generation? Come on. We've got a generation coming up that's bigger than us baby boomers. 80 million of the new generation. They're called millennials. How many of you have read Time Magazine last spring? The me, me, me generation. You see, as a missionary, I'm not just called to a a culture or to a different country, but maybe there's a calling to a generation. Because these millennials, 80 million strong, they're global. They're not just local. This is a generation that's had access, yet feels alienated and doesn't understand what family's about. You see, it's a changing America. And I wished it wasn't. Trust me, I love antique stores. I love old stuff. I love the 50s. But that's not where we're at today. And the Bible says that we're, we're here for such a time as this. And I believe as a missionary that we're called to reach that next generation. Yes, we're to fulfill God's purpose for our generation, but we've got, to, we've got to seek that next generation. We've got to reach that next generation. Let me tell you a little bit about the millennials. Oh, wow. 40% believe they should be promoted every two years regardless of performance. The average middle-class American family today walks amid 85 pictures of themselves and their pets. This generation has the highest likelihood of having unmet expectations with respect to their careers and the lowest levels of satisfaction with their careers at the stage that they're at. What millennials are most famous for besides narcissism is its effect, entitlement. Millennials, now listen, you that are millennials, that doesn't necessarily have to apply to you. But on the cover of this magazine, it says millennials are lazy, entitled narcissists who still live with their parents. It's a different generation. A generation that needs to know and experience the power and the love of God. Listen, I'm one that I, I just, I'd love to be stuck in time. And many of you relate to that. You know, you love the old ways, the old days, the ancient paths. But God has called us to reach the next generation. I don't know how to do that because, trust me, learning a remote for the television is challenging for me. And I've got an iPhone. The only reason I got an iPhone is because my son lost it and I found it and I activated it. And I said, I'm determined to learn this thing. And I swore I'd never be on Facebook. But guess what? I'm on Facebook big time. 
and I'm getting caught up in the culture. <laughs> but maybe it could be used for the glory of God. You see what's interesting, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, starting at, uh, I think it's verse 19, the apostle, yeah, 9, 19, 1 Corinthians, the apostle Paul says, listen, I've got to become all things to all men, that by all means I might save some. Now I'm going to give you four R's on how to reach the next generation. I don't have all the answers. I, if you want to see this magazine, don't be mad. I didn't write the article. Those of you that are millennials. But we've got to reach the next generation with the power of God. And I want to give you four R's in reaching the next generation. Number one, if we're going to reach the next generation, we have got to be real. That means all this fakey facade and pseudo-spirituality is out the door. They'll see right through it. It's no different than presenting the gospel at the county jail. You can't con a con, and you're not going to con a millennial. You're not going to pull any wool on their eyes because they were grew up. They'll get on their iPhone and find out the facts immediately. You've got to be real. What are we really who we say we are? Are we really who we say we are? I want to read, I'm reading out of this book called um, You Lost Me. Why a new generation is leaving church. And let me read you this excerpt here. And I am an aging baby boomer because I can't see with or without glasses anymore. But listen to this. Millennials are disillusioned with tradition. They are frustrated with slick or shallow expressions of religion. I want to be part of a Christian community that is more than a performance one day a week. And I want a more traditional faith rather than a hip version of Christianity. Are you all with me on this? These millennials want a genuine faith. They want us to be real. And let's quit trying to be something that we're not. Let's be real if we're going to reach the next generation. Number two, we've got to be relevant. We've got to be relevant. What does it mean to be relevant? That means that we've got to count. And you know what I tell the inmates at Louisville Metro? I tell them, that, listen, if you're breathing in and out, which it looks like everybody is around this circle, we sit in a circle, we do a support group, I say, men, if you're breathing in and out and you're alive, God still has a purpose and plan for your life. That's being relevant. I'm relevant when I know there's a purpose for my life that's eternal. Guys and ladies, we've got to understand no matter how old you are, this thing of retirement, forget it. It's not in the Bible. Does it mean you've got to work hard, hard labor all your life? No, that's not what I'm talking about. Maybe you need to do something easier that's physical, but God, if you're breathing it out, God still has a purpose for your life. And we've got to be relevant. We've got to be relevant. And let's ask ourselves the question, how relevant is our church to the culture? Do we matter? Do we matter? Let me read this out of uh, this book here real quick. Being relevant. Life without sense of urgency, a life that is safe, incubated, insular, overprotected, consumptive, is not worth living. The next generation is aching for influence, for significance, for lives of meaning and impact. Is everybody with me today? You see, in American culture, we want to be protected oftentimes as Christians. We want to be insulated. We want to live in our bubble. My kids say that Beth and I live in a bubble. I love our bubble. We have empty nests. We go from one Christian activity to another. I love the bubble that we're in. But we've got to be relevant. And in America, we want to back our way into a comfortable corner. But God wants us to take a risk and step out. And this new generation wants to be challenged. Not about comfortable Christianity and convenience but with true conviction, true conviction and a risk, taking a risk. Are we risk takers for the kingdom and the glory of God? 
Are we relevant? God, help me never to be a papa in a rocking chair, eyes glued to the boob tube, and I've lost my purpose in life. God, may we always be relevant. There is so much need out here. There is so much need. Wherever you turn, there's hurting, hurting people. Everywhere. I was in Delphi, Indiana on Friday. Beth and I drove up in the snow and met the police chief of Delphi, Indiana. Name is John Chapman. John Chapman is resigning as police chief to do Lifeline full-time because the Lord has opened doors for him to do groups with middle school students and their moms and dads. The public school system, he told them it's faith-based. They said, we don't care. We got to have help. Our kids and our families are in crisis. They're working with the Office of Probation and Parole. They're working in corrections. This is a police chief stepping out, taking a risk to fulfill God's purpose, not for just his generation, but for that, the, the, the generation to come. Hallelujah. I want you to pray for John and Cindy Chapman. Some of you are on my Facebook, and I put their picture on there. They're stepping out in faith to serve the Lord. Why? Because God still has a plan, a purpose, and a will for their lives. They're relevant. They're relevant. God, help me always to be relevant. We've got to be real. We've got to be relevant. And number three, we've got to be relational. Let me tell you something about these millennials. They're on Facebook and they got thousands, I mean thousands of friends. And yet they feel alienated and alone. Why? Because most of them were raised in a single parent home, number one. Number two, they don't understand God-ordained authority of a father. And for those of us that are fathers and papas, we got awesome, awesome responsibility. And just because your kids may be adults and they may be raised, it doesn't mean you're not a father anymore. That's when real fatherhood really begins. This new millennial generation, they've got Facebook and they're putting their best pictures forward, but I'm telling us, reminding us, there's a lot of lonely kids today. Nothing ever replaces real relationships. Y'all with me? Facebook does not replace real relationships. I don't know about you, I gotta have real friends. And I'm not just talking about buddies, I'm talking about I've gotta have some real friends. We've got to be relational if we're gonna meet the needs of the next generation. Listen to this. Being relational. Te technological access allows millennials the, to experience and examine content originating from non-biblical worldviews, giving them ample reasons to question the nature of truth. It generates extraordinary distractions and invites them to be less linear and logical in their thought process. It empowers them to think as participants, not just as consumers of media. And it makes them both more connected and more isolated than generations before them. Now, let me read this to you. And I've read this just a little bit ago, but I want to read it again. I want to be part of Christian community. That is more than a performance one day a week. We all long to be part of Christian community. We need one another more than ever. God has called us to be part of Christian community. Are we willing to lay down our lives for one another? We want to reach the next generation. We've got to be relational. Now, some of you may tend to be like me and you're task oriented. Most of us men are task oriented and most ladies are relationally oriented, okay? It's time for us men to come back a little bit and be a little bit more relational. That means we're going to talk, that means we're going to sit down, stop working. Working doesn't need to be our idol, men. Take time and let's be relational like God meant for us to be if we're going to reach our kids and grandkids. Relational. You know, it's hard to find some things in common with the kids today, isn't it, sometimes? I mean, I'm, I'm 
I love old stuff. I love history. I love the history of World War II. I got a whole house full of junk. And I love it when my son brought his girlfriend over yesterday and I told her I had a 46 Jeep in a barn and she was excited. It was so much fun to take that young lady to the barn and show her my 46 Jeep. Because most people don't give a rip. But it was so much fun. Here's somebody that actually cares about something I have. You know. Guys, you know what I'm talking about. And I got G.I. Joes that I had when I was a kid. And I got Tonka trucks. And I got all kind of Hot Wheels. And I got all kind of toys. But guess what? The kids want to turn on the tube. They want virtual reality. So sometimes it's hard to build a bridge. But by the grace of God, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, by all means, I've got to save some. Let's build a bridge and connect some way, somehow. God, help us to be relational. Church is about Christian community. Enjoying one another's presence and companionship and conversation and relationship. God create us relational. And for us men, sometimes we've really got to work at it. Trust me, I grew up in a home where work was number one in life. If you could work, you was a good kid, okay? So we learn how to work in my household. And sometimes that's hard to turn off when you get a little older. Let's be real. Let's be relevant. Let's be relational. And let's be reliable. Reliable. And reliable to the Lord, reliable to his word, you see, we can all be the, we can be all these things, but if we're not reliable, if we don't come back to the Word of God and to who He is and the conviction that Jesus is Lord and His Word is applicable today as it was 2,000 years ago, then we're in trouble. I can be all relational and singing kumbaya, but if I'm not reliable to the Word, the eternal Word of God and His purposes, then I'm in trouble. You know, I want to read one last thing out of this book that I'm studying out of. It's a little story about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And all of us are learning to live as Christians in America in spite of what's going on in America, right? And the challenge that we face in Teen Challenge is that we take students into our program, we bring them out of the culture, put them in a culture that we hope is a little bit of heaven on earth, for some of them, trust me, they feel like it's hell on earth. And we put them in a sequestered environment and we teach them to live for Jesus, but they step, the day they step out of the program, they relapse. Not all of them, and thank God a smaller percentage, and we're working on those smaller percentages, but the fact is somehow, some way, we've got to learn to live as a Christian in society in this culture, no matter what's going on in the culture. Let's not get so caught up in our culture that we fit into it without even thinking. And I want to challenge us what's going on in our culture. And I will tell you the number one life controlling addiction in America is not cocaine, it's not heroin, it's not pot, it's not even cigarettes and booze, it's sex. And may God insulate us and give us a covering and put a hedge around us to protect us from the vileness and the sexual sins of this generation. And I want to remind us, and I joked about staying on a soapbox and talking about television, but our television today has become prime time pornography. And may we as Christians protect, and dads, you better protect your kids. Husbands, you better protect your wife. You're the boundary, you're the hedge. You're the one responsible to keep that stuff out of your home. And I want to challenge us. Maybe it's today that we go home and we unplug. I'm not paying for cable television. Now, that's my soapbox. I'm not here to condemn, convict, or be negative, or, or be on a soapbox. But I'm telling us, let's be careful what comes in to our home. My wife and I are new papas and mamas, okay? We're new grandparents. And I'm so thankful that my grandson can come to a place he feels secure. I'm thankful he comes to a place he knows we're going to be there. Come hell or high water, Nene and Papa are going to be there. We're going to be there. And we're going to have a home that's conducive to godly living. 
And that means I've got to go through my home and do a cleansing. That I've got to throw out the things that would defile the Holy Spirit from being present in my home. And that means there's times I've got to unplug. And I like a good movie just as much as anybody, but there are times I've got to say enough of enough. That will not come into my home and defile my home. Sexual sin is destroying relationships across this land. People aren't getting married and we're, we're, we've, we've uh, taken marriage and, and God has created marriage as a holy act. Thank God for those of you that are committed to your marriage. Because more than ever, our marriages, our relationships are under attack. Sexual sin, the number one life-controlling addiction in America. May it not affect my home, nor your home, nor this church. And young people, God has made a way for us to be fulfilled physically. And that's through a thing called marriage. It's still honored by God and still an institution ordained by God and still God's best plan. And I can tell you after 33 years of marriage, I thank God that he's kept Beth and I together by his grace. Let's keep our homes together. Let's keep our marriages sanctified. And let's turn off when we need to turn off. And let's do a cleansing of our homes when it's time to do a cleansing of our home. Now, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Risking holiness doesn't always have a happy ending, however. During World War II, German pastor Dietrich Bonhoeffer took a stand against Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich and against the German church which ignored and even supported the Nazi regime. Bonhoeffer was convicted that followers of Christ have an obligation not to withdraw from culture, even when it is as wicked as the Nazis, but to be in it and not to, be, not to accommodate the culture like the German church did, but not be of it. Are you all with me on this? We're in this culture. We live in this world. We live in America. We live in Kentucky. We live in E-Town. I live in Louisville. I can't withdraw from the culture. I'm part of it. But God has called us to affect the culture, not for the culture to affect us. Can't we be real? Can't we be real relational? Can't we be relevant? Can't we be anointed and reliable that we can make a commitment to change the culture? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, guess what? He lost his life trying to change the culture. But guess what? Dietrich Bonhoeffer, even after death, is still affecting hundreds of thousands of believers for the glory of God. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads. I have no idea what time it is. have no idea how long I'm supposed to go. I know we got started late. Thank you for allowing me to come and share on missions. This isn't necessarily a pretty message. But how many of us will say, yes, I want to reach that next generation? How many of us will say, yes, God has called Lakeside to change the culture of E-Town and of this county, Hardin County, Meade County, whatever county this is, and to make a difference? How many of you raise your hand and say, yes, Skip, God's called us not to be caught up in the culture, but to change the culture. God, I pray this morning and this afternoon as we leave this place, Lord, you'll give us a new conviction as Bonhoeffer had that he's not going to get caught up in this Nazi regime. He's not going to get caught up in an accommodating church, but he's called to make a difference in his culture. God, I pray you have called every one of us. If we're breathing it out, God, you still have a plan, a purpose, and a will. God, I pray we would submit to that plan, that purpose, and that will, and be relevant in 2014 to make a difference in E-Town, in Kentucky, and all across America. In the name of Jesus. Pastor, come. Hallelujah. Praise God. What a message. What a message. You hadn't lost it, Skip. Pepo, being a Pepo hadn't ruined your preaching. Thank God for, uh, for a message challenging us to, to step outside the box and and it's actually pretty amazing how well this message sets us up for the next several weeks because uh, the theme for Lakeside Worship Center this year is going to be shift. And shift doesn't necessarily mean change directions. It could mean change gears. And one of the things we're going to be really emphatic about this year 
is building relationships with each other and establishing community with each other. And you'll notice last year we did a, an attempt of uh, some community groups and we kind of did a tactical with, withdrawal because we recognized we weren't quite there yet. And you're going to start seeing some of this material because some of our community groups are going to consist of people that are overcoming addictions. Some of our community groups are going to consist of people that, that are concerned people, that are concerned persons. And uh, the, 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 the session that Skip took our church through was overcoming setbacks and disappointments. When people let you down. How many ever had somebody let you down? And maybe that's still having an impact and an effect on you. And you need some help overcoming that. I would love to establish a group right in your home. Doesn't even have to be at a church. Doesn't even have to be at a traditional time. And equip you and give you all that you need in order to be able to, to minister not only to yourself, but to those who maybe have similar problems as you. Maybe some of you just say, hey, I just want to get to know Jesus better. I'm not addicted to anything. I just want to get to know Jesus better. We want to help you set that up. And that's where Pastor John is going to play a pivotal, pivotal, pivotal role. And uh, this week, I'm going, to, I'm going to let him close out the service. And he's just going to pray and just take one minute. Next week, I'll give you five. Take one minute to dismiss you. And uh, we'd just like to introduce Pastor John and Jennifer. They're going to serve as our connection pastors. And their job is to help you. Go ahead. Their job is to help me help you establish community in this church. We want to build relationships. And what I've learned quickly is as this church is growing, I can only establish a genuine relationship with about 20% of you. I can't have a genuine relationship with all of you. You're getting too big for me. So we've got more pastoral teams, and we're going to reintroduce all of our ministers next week. And we're really going to give you an opportunity to, to understand the ministry team that we have. But we want to help 100% of you have genuine relationships with each other in some way. Amen. John, close out. How many of you enjoyed Brother Skip this morning? Yesterday we met as a vision team. There's a, a small group that Pastor Tim's put together as a vision team for this church. And uh, Brother Skip, everything you said this morning went right along with what we've been talking about. God has created us for a purpose and he's put Lakeside Worship Center here for a particular reason. And we need each of you because each of you have been given talents and resources and gifts that God has placed you here to use and if you're not using them then you're not in the will of God and we want to help you get in the will of God using those gifts and talents and relationships and we'll be talking about that more over the next number of weeks months and, and years I thank God for men of God who will come and preach and deliver a word that God is giving them father we thank you this morning Lord you are God, you're so much more than we could ever describe. Father, we give feeble attempts at, at worship and honoring you and, and lifting up praise. But Father, you're so much greater and mightier than that. Father, we ask that this morning as, as each of us leave, that, that Lord, we would take this challenge that Skip brought. God, that we would not just put it aside or put it away and not just remember it as hey that was a good word but father that we would actually take and plant it in our lives and that, father you would take and, and bring rain and, and nourishment to that word and father that it would grow and lord that we would produce fruit based upon the word that was given today Father, I ask this morning that as these go, that, Father, you would bless them and keep them. That, Father, you would cause your face to shine upon them. And that, Lord, that you would give each one peace this morning. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. One last thing. Everybody that's willing to stay, the hallway is going to be tight, but we are opening our brand new Bible Institute. We're doing a ribbon cutting ceremony. So all of you that can stay, if you just go out that door, or go out that hallway and go that way. We'll all meet. We're going to do a ribbon cutting ceremony. Otherwise, you're free to go 